call from the United States of America. Hi, you have reached the Decahedron RPG cast feedback line. Just start talking at the sign of the tone. Ooh, I can't believe I didn't think of the peripheral. I just read that recently. Like after the show came out, I binged it. Well, no, I didn't binge it. I watched it week to week. I had a, um, there was someone else at work that was watching it with me and we had conversations about it. After that wrapped up, I got the book. The book is so good. But for some reason, I don't think of cyberpunk as hard science fiction. I mean, I guess it is, right? Um, Oh, well, can I change my answer? Hey, Carl. Thanks for that call. Three things stood out to me. Uh, first of all, you said that you didn't binge it, but you watched it weekly. My wife and I are actually very adamant about binging things. And if they're not available all at once, for example, uh, Jack Ryan on Amazon, we won't watch it until the full series is available. And then we can watch them all the way we want. So that's our preference. We will make sure we can do it. Then about cyberpunk being hard sci-fi. So I would say that cyberpunk is sci-fi. And just like some sci-fi is hard and some sci-fi isn't, some cyberpunk is hard sci-fi and some cyberpunk isn't. As for whether or not the peripheral is, while there is time travel involved, it's really only the time travel of information and information theory is like this new branch of science that like boggles my mind. And I, I don't know everything, but I do think I heard recently that they do theorize that it is possible to send information back in time. So um, that would be interesting. And that would make uh, the peripheral hard sci-fi. Although, you know, my initial reaction was like, no, that, that's not hard sci-fi. And lastly, can you change your answer? Yeah, you can change your answer for sure. I mean, I'm not going to redo the drawing. You still didn't win, but you, you can lose with a different answer. <laughs> hey, Carl, thanks a lot for that call. Hey, this is Jason. Just listen to the episode 81 feedback line. Wow, I'm not talking to this morning. I need more coffee. But I want to mention you talked about how you would have the players run NPCs if you made a bunch of NPCs to fill the vacancies in the Traveler crew these days. And I think that's kind of an interesting topic. The idea of should the player control the NPC or should the GM control the NPC? So I know you said you had too many topics already, or, or at least you already have a, a lot of topics. But if you need another one, there you go. Hey, Jason. You know, that's an interesting question. Um, could I do an episode on that? I'm not sure I could fill up <laughs> enough time to be a full episode unless there was somebody who disagreed with my stance that would be willing to take the second chair. Do you disagree, Jason? If there is anybody else out there, you, you want to do an episode with me? Take the opposite approach saying, no, the players should never play the NPCs because I'm firmly on the side that uh, players should play the NPCs. But yeah, I think that'd make a great episode as long as I can find someone who is sincerely on the other side. You know, I don't want people pretending to be. I'm very big believer in sincerity on the mic. Thanks a lot for that call, Jason. And yeah, hopefully... Somebody will uh, volunteer. Bye. Joe and Jane, people, Jeff. Just listen to the recent product review there of the uh, Kellenor product, whatever it was, from Judges Guild. I uh, appreciate you doing that. I uh, thought it was interesting. The like and dislike, yeah, product of the time, and typos irritate me even with when you see them nowadays and stuff that should be more proofread but i digress there so yeah great stuff thanks for doing that uh i do like the idea of refreshing it the fact that it was od and d originally uh it probably would benefit from a uh, refresh to saying hey let's do it for the bx rule set let's do it for a d and d one e maybe even five e uh, you know, however you want to do it, or put in some other game system. So, yeah, uh, sounds like an interesting little task there. Um, maybe I'll join you on it. I don't know. Depends on how, how much you want to really put into it. 
But I think redoing the tables definitely would be a, a benefit to anybody wanting to do it today. All right. We'll catch you guys on the next show. Hey, Evil Jeff. Thanks for that call. Yeah, for the refresh, my working title is Snogan's Strange Strongholds. Um, Snogan is just my online, na online name that I've gone by ever since there was an online, really. It was actually the name of my first D&D &D character that I created. Not that I played. The first one I played was named Bjorg. He was a cleric. But Snogan, uh, he was the first character I ever made way back in the 1970s. As for the game system I would use, I think I would just leave it as generic OSR. Because the only thing that's game system specific is the list of monsters. And any OSR GM can translate monsters any way they want. And again, I wouldn't give monster stats or anything. I would just say, you know, bullywugs, except they might be, are they under the OGL or is that one of the ones that TSR kept for themselves? Anyway, um, yeah, I think I would just leave the game system open in, in generic and, you know, not addressed. It just, you know, that's part of what the GM does is use the stats that they want uh, for their game system. But hey, yeah, thanks for that call. And thanks for semi-volunteering to join the uh, Snogan's Strange Stronghold Committee there. Thanks. Bye. Joe and James, Evil Jeff again. The product that you just reviewed, uh, Kellner product from Judges Guild, I had another thought about it. And it reminds me of the B1 adventure from TSR Into the Unknown, where you've got this layer of previous heroes that you stumble across and the rooms are empty. You as a GM stock them and there's a list of treasure, list of monsters to put throughout and it gives you guidelines on how many rooms should have monsters, empty, treasure, et cetera, like that. So it's a good tool to have and you wouldn't have the same thing every time or the same thing between all GMs. So it's a good product to have. And I think it's, uh, it, it holds up still really well. Hey, thanks for that second call, Evil Jeff. Yeah, you know, I didn't think about B1. Uh, it is a good uh, analogy. It's not quite the same because nowhere in B1, uh, at least that I recall, you get to change the layout of the dungeon or anything like that. But yeah, you do get to add monsters and treasure, which is really cool. Uh, I wish Gygax had brought that forward when he uh, did B2 because he couldn't afford to pay Mike Carr's royalties anymore. But yeah, good good call. Thanks. Hey guys, Jason here. Really enjoyed the Frontier Forts episode. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. It's a very early, probably not the earliest, but I wonder if Judges Guild is the first one to come up with the adventure generator concept. I don't know. I'd have to look at some old strategic reviews and other products, but Yet yeah, the the idea of having random tables to generate an adventure is pretty common in products now, but this is definitely an earlier example of it. I have not played Frontier Fort, so I think an updated version of that would be really neat and be a great project to do. Very interested in that. Um, yeah, you know, overall, I think you guys did a great job reviewing it, and we're very fair. And I look forward to your solo episode where you generate some things using tables. So keep up the great work. Hey, Jason, thanks for that call. I do not think I would give uh, Judges Guild the title for the first generator. I think that would definitely go to Gygax's solo dungeon generator that was in one of the early, early editions of the strategic review. So, yeah, I would, I would give that one to that. As for the solo episode, by the time this one comes out, that one is already out. Actually, I broke it down into two parts. The first part is just me going through the tables and everything. And then the second part is uh, after I put the story together, the backstory and everything together. Part one was last Wednesday. Part two is next Wednesday. <laughs> Thanks for that call, Jason. And to answer James's prompt at the end, I would definitely be interested in playing if we could make the schedule work. So, although we have a couple episodes to record first, but yeah, I would be down to play this. Hey, Jason. Thanks for that. Yeah, I thought I would um, get away with something by putting the prompt after the outro music. I figured everybody stops listening by then, and no one would hear that idea that James had for me to run a game. Isn't that nice of him to volunteer me? But yeah, okay, I got you down. If I run it, you're down. Maybe James will be down, so that's two. 
I'd say one or two other players. Anyone else interested? <laughs> Curse you, James. And thanks, Jason. Bye. I love the episode where you were creating the characters, but I'd love to see the character sheet. Are you going to do that anytime soon? Hey, James. I have to admit, I'm a little confused by that call. Um, <laughs> you're the one that, whose character we made. I gave you a copy of the character sheet, like the same day or the day after. And if you mean you think other people would want to see it, I posted it on the Play forums the same day the episode came out, which was over two weeks before you made that call. So I'm, I'm really confused uh, by, by what you're getting at. Other than if you're trying to give me an opportunity to plug the forums. So hey, everybody, every so often, you know, like in this case, when we made a character or something else, if there's a file to go along with that, I will upload those at the Play web forums, which is www.decahedron.com slash boards. Remember, spell decahedron with a K. The link's in the show notes. Thanks, James. Hey, Joe, it's Michael, Chicago is. I just listened to your Sandboxes in Space episode, and I really enjoyed it. I liked hearing your thought process and you know, how you noodled on ideas and took back experiences and whatnot. And it's really hard to have criticisms over somebody's creativity and their own thoughts. This is your campaign. You get to run it as you see fit. So no, no criticisms are, are going to come from me. I will tell you some thoughts I had that, you know, it things that just came to my mind of, oh, wouldn't it be cool of this? You mentioned space combat and the need for exploration and, and so on. And one of the overarching themes is there needs to be a driver. Why, why explore? Why jump? You know, what, why not? You know, you find the first planet that's roughly suitable technology-wise and uh, interest-wise, and these people are maybe going to want to stay and not explore anymore. Hey, we like planet C. You know, it's got everything to call the comforts of home. I always think of there needs to be something driving that why. Um, and I liberally steal from everywhere. And something that came to mind is, I don't know if you ever saw the uh, Stargate uh, Universe series. And it, spoilers, basically the play, the, the, the players, the uh, characters on the show had no real control over the ship and where it went, how it jumped. And it was made by ancients and there were space battles because the spaceship was fighting other ancient drones that were seated around and, you know, all sorts of neat things. Maybe that's the driver. Maybe the players don't have control over the jumps, when it happens, how it happens. Maybe that's a feature, not a bug. And, you know, they get to explore, they get to do something, they get to solve the problem, but you better be back on that ship or you're going to have bad things happen. And maybe they're linked to that ship so that no matter what, once that ship jumps, they're jumping too. Um, I don't know. Just random thoughts. You know, there are all sorts of ways. You know, maybe they're uh, exploring in the footsteps of these mysterious beings. And they encounter, you know, enigmatic NPCs that aren't aliens, but are aliens. Because they you don't know what they are. When they explode, they kind of fall apart. Who knows? Anyway, just random thoughts that came to mind. I hope you'll uh, continue to podcast about your Traveler campaign, and I look forward to hearing from it. Take care. Bye-bye. Hey, Michael slash Chicago Wiz. Thanks for that call. As for criticisms, yeah, I, I wasn't really looking for criticisms. of well, Maybe I was of the, uh, of the sandbox setting there, but more so of the episode itself. Does that make good content? Do you find that worth listening to you? Or would you rather not hear that type of stuff and you'd rather hear some of the other stuff I do? Different people like different things. It's, it's good to hear what the audience likes and doesn't like. As for your thoughts, the first thing I wrote down listening to it was, why explore? And that's interesting that you said that because I've always considered exploration to be like this fundamental human drive 
you know, you're, you're somewhere and you're like, what's above that next hill? What's over that next hill? What's through that forest? What is that next thing? And that's just at the core of, of who we are, the foundation of what it means to be human is to go out and to discover. And wasn't that one of the core themes of, of Star Trek? So, yeah, I always just thought that was a given. That, that is who we are. That is what we are meant to do. But in game terms, in, the, in one of the ideas I had, which was the rising from the ashes of the collapsed space, empire, federation, whatever, was the concept of, of rebuilding that glory that used to be Again, that was a driving force behind much of what happened in the medieval Europe. You know, they were trying to recreate the Roman Empire in that glory that yesterday always seems to have, uh, whether or not it's true. The idea you said from Stargate, you know, I never watched Stargate. I saw the original Stargate movie in the movie theater, and I wasn't very impressed. I didn't like it. I thought it was kind of uh, yeah, you know, predictable, derivative, all that stuff. So when the TV series came out, I I never bothered. And then there were like three more series, but I, I've heard that they were good, but I, I don't know. They might have been. I have never seen them, so I can't tell you. But the idea of the players being on the ship that they have no control of and it just goes wherever it wants, in other words, wherever the GM wants, leading the players by the nose from adventure to adventure, saying this is what you're going to do, that is a common style of GMing. That's a common style of play. Some, pe- some players thrive on it. I think James would thrive on that. If you listen to the episode where I talk to him about sandboxes and why he struggles with sandboxes, I, I think that might work for him. But for my style of GMing, that would not work for me at all. I like the players to have their own drive, their own initiative, their own goals, and go out to accomplish those goals, not me uh, keeping them captive. To go from adventure to venture. Last thing you said that caught my ear was aliens, not aliens. And I want to tell you a little story. Uh, so I said I had a few other science fiction universes, right? The first one was the Astral Web. The next one was the Commonwealth of Man. Both of which, I mean, it's been years since I played them, so I can give out the spoilers. Both of which, you'll like this, but both of which were very much the setup for a Galactica-style campaign. In both of them, Earth was this lost thing that humans couldn't get back to. But in the, the first one of those, in the astral web, uh, part of the problem was instead of Cylons, there was this alien race called the Milthrani. And uh, they were skinny, they were fur-covered, I, you know, lanky. I, I had a whole description. That's, that's not important right now. But yeah, they were like these alien invaders that came back and like conquered half the galaxy. I mean, not galaxy as in the Milky Way galaxy, as in the map of the universe. Again, using probability matrices or whatever I was using at the time. Uh, it's easy to have a pretty self-contained u- universe when you say, oh, ships can't jump beyond this much and you don't have the fuel, so I guess there's nothing else, nowhere else you can go. Uh, anyway. The Planet of the Apes ending that was planned for that campaign had the players gotten that far, uh, I ended up having to leave Texas. That's what killed that one. Was that the Milthrani were actually the evolved state of humans from Earth after like some biological issues happened. So the quest to find home and to flee the Milthrani uh, menace would only actually leave the Milthrani homeworld, which was our homeworld, which, yeah. so. That's where that campaign was planned. Anyway, thank you very much for that call, Michael. I very much appreciate it. Bye. Hey, Joe. I'm slamming you with phone calls. I'm finally catching up, Daniel. So great episode on the sandbox uh, in space. Very, very cool. It actually reminded me you had asked a question in one of the, or you made a comment or something on one of the uh, call-in shows. You said, "Why, why would I do Traveler 1977 versus 81? And you nailed it right there. It's just talking to a lot of people. It seems like 77 was written with a voice that said, do what you want. Where by the time I got to 81, it was more like, this is our world, run it. Maybe not super strictly that, but the changes that they made voice-wise, not so much the system, because it was funny because you named some mechanical things. I don't care about that. I can change mechanics myself. When I read a book, I want to buy.
So, yeah, I guess then you answered, I guess, the other question that I called, and I said, I didn't know why you were worried so much about combat, but it sounds like it's a big deal for you. I don't really care about space combat in my games, so uh, that wouldn't be a big deal for me, but I could totally see it being uh, a cool part of the game. Hey, Daniel, thanks for that call. As for slamming me with phone calls, that's like apologizing for slamming me with money. Hey, just keep it coming. I love the feedback. I thrive on it. So thank you very much for it. Uh, 77 versus 81, or first edition versus second edition, as I like to say, because people often overlook that the little black books on the inside cover for the 81 editions all say second edition. So I just call it second edition. Anyway, um, the third Imperium <laughs> and uh, mechanical stuff, I actually wrote that down as two separate notes, which is funny because it's, it's actually the, the same thing in reverse. You said that you don't care about the rules. You can do those yourself, and then you kind of garbled out. So I'm going to assume you're going to then say about the setting, and you don't like how it gets its tendrils in the, the way. I'm exactly the opposite. I don't care about the setting, and I can pretty much ignore that. Exception being, actually, there's some positive and negative exceptions, I guess, to be fair. I'll say them all. So the negative exception being like the last edition of Tunnels and Trolls that came out was Deluxe Tunnels and Trolls. And as huge of a Tunnels and Trolls fan as I am, I never got that edition because over half the book was Troll World. And that's like buying D&D and being forced to buy world of Greyhawk. that just rubs me the wrong way and there's no way i'm going to do it but i do remember as a kid i know we started out with the 77 books and when i finally got my books they were the 81 books second edition books and i remember having like somebody's borrowed copy or something at the time and reading about all this imperium stuff and going back and looking at the other one it's like what is all this it wasn't in the other one but when I look at a rule set, I look at the rules. I always come up with my own settings. I don't like playing other people's settings. The positive examples that I said I would talk about being like Star Trek, because who doesn't love Star Trek? <laughs> and Paranoia, because that was just such a wonderful rule system. Um, you've heard me before, I'm sure, talk about friend computer and scrubbing the algae bats and all that's from uh, Paranoia. And I just love that setting. But beyond that, yeah, I'd much rather do my own settings. And it's easy for me to ignore setting stuff when it's just like mentioned here and there. So when I evaluate a book, I evaluate it on the mechanical stuff. So that's actually kind of funny how we look at the role a little differently there. The last thing about you not thinking space combat is important. Uh, again, we're just looking at the world differently again. But to me, a space opera without space combat is peanut butter and jelly sandwich without peanut butter and jelly um, or the bread. You know, just just try to imagine Star Trek with no space battles ever. Try to imagine Star Wars without a space battle. Um, that no, it's 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 not the heart of what space opera is in my mind, but it's the blood coursing through the veins. It's it is what space opera is. It is yeah. So in my in my mind, you cannot have space opera without epic space battles or at least space battles so yeah it is important to me awesome awesome call thanks for that daniel hey joe daniel from Bennett's keep all right through massive amounts of investigation i have determined that uh the mountains are the appalachian mountains i should have known that being that the appalachian trail crosses pretty much right in front of my house but i don't know i thought maybe that was just the name but there you go the mountains are part of the appalachian trail or the Appalachian uh, Mountains, a sub-range known as the Reading Prong, or Reading Prong, depending on if you're from Massachusetts or not, I guess. <laughs> Anyways, there you go. That is not RPG-related at all, unless you want to involve that in one of your games. But anyways, uh, have a good day. Hey, Daniel. Thanks for that mountainous call. Yeah, I, I knew they were at the Appalachians. I mean, the Catskills and the Adirondacks, they're all part of the Appalachians. All the all the Atlantic states mountains are part of the Appalachians, the blue mountains down south, the white mountains in New Hampshire, the green mountains in Vermont, Berkshires in um, Massachusetts. It's all part of the Appalachians. You mentioned the Appalachian Trail. A few episodes ago when I was with Evil Jeff, I talked about the scientist I work with who wrote the novel that uh, they're making a movie 
based on. And one of his things is walking the Appalachian Trail. In his office, he has the sections that he has uh, walked on. He's not through hiking the entire distance start to finish, but he does a section every year. And so that's on his wall. So the, the red and prong. So now I know r- roughly where that is. I am in Western New York. So we don't have mountains here. We, we, you know, the ice age came over with the glaciers and took away anything we might have resembling a hill. But um, I say Western New York. Technically speaking, it's the Finger Lakes region. The Western New York is, is Buffalo. One of my jobs is in Western New York. I live in the Finger Lakes district. When I travel home to Rhode Island, where I grew up, so no, not Massachusetts, but Rhode Island, which is even better, um, I have to drive on the Castleton on Hudson Bridge, which is on I-90 going across the Hudson. Are you familiar with this bridge? I think this is a very, very scary bridge. I get white knuckle every time I have to drive over it. Anyway, not game related at all, but a very good call. Thanks, Daniel. Hey everyone, I'm calling this one on time. I do want to thank everyone that called in, give a little hat tip to their podcasts. In alphabetical order, we had Chicago Wiz slash Michael, who is host of the Dungeon Masters Handbook podcast. We had Daniel from the Bandits Keep podcast. We had Evil Jeff from the Minions and Musings podcast. And we had Jason from the Nerds RPG Variety cast. And of course, we had James, who doesn't have a podcast home right now but he is supposedly working on it so we are hopeful joe rudely forgot to mention carl of the gmologist podcast as punishment joe has been sent to wipe down the inside of the fusion reaction chamber anyway i'm calling this one for time i still have some feedback in the queue but don't let that stop you from calling in i love the feedback i thrive on it Go ahead, send in that feedback, feedback at decahedron.com, say hi.chat slash decahedron, so many other ways, the play forums, whatever. It's all in the outro music. It's all in the show notes. Thanks again for listening. Until next time, happy gaming, happy life. Bye. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Decahedron RPG cast. We'd love to hear from you. You can leave us a voice message by calling 562-774-2278. That's 562-RPG-CAST. Or by visiting sayhi.chat slash decahedron. You can also email us at feedback at decahedron.com. Links are in the show notes. For more information, visit decahedron.com. Remember that decahedron is spelled with a K. Music is by Kevin McLeod. Logo is by Design Cat. Thanks again for listening, and until next time, keep those dice rolling.